time. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. My name is Dawn Nickel. My pronouns are she, her. I'm one of the founders of the She Recovers Foundation. The other founder is my daughter, Taryn Strong. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge how grateful I am to live in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen and Wasanek peoples. The She Recovers Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit public charity. We connect, support, and empower women through our virtual platforms and in-person community networks. We are all recovering from something. We believe that recovery is a journey of waking up, navigating discomfort, and doing the work we must do to heal. Making space for inclusive and collaborative dialogues that focus on women's healing is necessary if we want to move forward in recovery together. Welcome to our very first critical conversation, Healing the Effects of Racism for Black Women in Recovery, a topic that may well be the most important issue of the present time. This past summer, we revised our set of intentions and guiding principles to include the following principle. We do our individual work in order to recreate and hold healing spaces for everyone. All women deserve recovery. And what is the work that we must do to heal, to hold healing spaces for all? Well, in this moment, the work that we are being called to do is anti-racism work. Racism is a reality for black, indigenous and women of color and men in recovery and beyond. Racism is systemic, severe and has long lasting effects. Racism prevents women of color in recovery from having a safe place to heal, a space that reflects who they are and honors their life experience. This is unacceptable. Acknowledging that racism exists in ourselves and in our recovery communities is essential. This conversation today is just a beginning. Thank you to the four women on our panel today. We are so grateful for the leadership and guidance of two of our own She Recovers coaches, Sherry Hampton and Esther Nicholson. They've been working on the idea for this webinar since early summer. And we are delighted to welcome and thank Vimala Sara St. John and Jocelyn Harvey, who we know will bring such richness to today's learning. We've gotten to know them over the last year. For the Black women who are joining us as guests, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. To the white women here, we invite you to listen to our panelists deeply. Learning and unlearning is white women's work in this moment, however uncomfortable that may be sometimes in the process. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Jocelyn Harvey. Jocelyn Harvey is a writer and podcaster. On her soul and mindset accounts, she talks about spirituality, mindset and recovery from a place of compassion, curiosity and relatability. In spaces that are often predominantly white and affluent leaning, Jocelyn isn't afraid to talk about race, privilege and the additional hardships certain groups contend with while still giving options for growth that are empowering and shame-free. She's also the author of Recovering the Home, which is a decluttering guide for sober women. Jocelyn, we're just so delighted that you're here. Thank you so much, over to you. Hello, thank you so much for having me. My name is Jocelyn Harvey. I'm going to be emceeing this event and I am just as excited to listen to this powerhouse team of black women, many of whom I know, and I'm so excited to get to know them even more. So I'm going to be kicking off with our first speaker, Sherry, but before I get into the bio, I'm going to share personal little stories. <laughs> I did not tell them this, but when I was a year sober, life had gotten a lot better in ways, but I still had so much inner anxiety, depression, and confusion going on. And there were several people in recovery who were just like, oh, that doesn't matter. It's, it's no big deal. But I knew it was a big deal. I knew there was something in me that wanted to be healed and helped and heard. And based off the things that Cherry would talk about on her Instagram account, I reached out to her and she did that. She heard, she shared her own story. She validated what I was going through. And it was so much the start that helped me work on my anxiety. Because as you know, when we start to recover, there's still things that are the underneath. So I will always be grateful for her support in that area. And now it's time to dive into all the great things that she does. So Sherry Hampton is the founder of Served Up Sober, a nonprofit organization devoted to increasing health equity in marginalized communities by creating holistic spaces for women of color who are sober or sober curious. As a certified recovery coach, motivational speaker, and woman in long-term recovery, Sherry combines her years of professional, personal, and 
professional and personal experience to passionately support like-minded women who are ready to cover from all the things. Sherry operates from a spiritually driven and empowered approach to healing, navigating her clients through a journey of self-discovery designed to connect their mind, body, and spirit with their own innate healing potential. Sherry is also a trusted advisor for She Recovers and an anti-racist consultant who works with recovery and treatment organizations to help them explore their own biases and create pathways to stronger relationships. What you will notice with Sherry and all the women on this is they are busy, they are boots on the ground, they are in there doing awesome, awesome work. In her uh, discussion topic for today, racism and your recovery becoming aware, she's going to be touching on how racism is a recovery threatening issue, the white rooms of recovery, and how we can reconcile these spaces. So without further ado, let us turn it over to Sherry Hampton. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, I remember that, um, that moment well when you came into the DMs and it was, it was nice to connect with you. Um, there weren't as many of us in the space as there are now. And so, um, yeah, I, I remember that. Wow, we are, we're beginning this process. We're starting it, um, healing. It begins with a conversation and um, thank you, She Recovers for allowing us to do this. Um, the time is right and it, it feels right in this moment. You know, the question always comes up in the, in the feed, at least in my feed, um, whenever I talk about the lack of justice being served in our country regarding the murdering of black people, it comes up, what, is, what does this have to do with recovery? And um, there's, always, there's always a tiny little backlash whenever I post something. And I, I, I don't post a lot, um, I can be honest, it's painful. It's, it's not easy to continually hashtag and continually bring up what's going on. So I, I don't post a lot. But when I do, the question always comes up somewhere from someone that they just don't understand what this has to do with recovery and, and, and why are we politicizing the recovery space? So I think before we can have a conversation about racism in the recovery face, space, we first have to acknowledge that it exists. We have to become aware of that. Um, racism is something that's everywhere. It's in the air that we breathe and the recovery spaces aren't immune to that. They just, they just aren't. Um, I think that Jocelyn mentioned earlier that I'm developing an anti-racism training for the recovery spaces. And in my research, I came across an article that was written by Kenneth Pons entitled The Trauma of Racism, America's Original Sin. And he defines racial trauma as the physiological, psychological, and emotional damage caused by stressors or racial harassment or discrimination. He goes on to say that it includes a negative, sudden and uncontrollable experience, crisis or ongoing physical or psychological threat. And I know that, that Esther is going to go into deeper detail when, when we continue this conversation and she really deep dives into the, the healing part of this, but I wanted to touch a little bit on 2020, if I can, and just kind of set the stage for what it really, really, really feels like to be a black woman in America right now. The media can't even possibly cover everything. But if you think about the three murders that happened that probably got the most media attention, you think about Ahmaud Arbery, you think about George Floyd, you think about Breonna Taylor. And I would, I would just pause for a minute for that. Just acknowledging that loss. But then also I would wanna ask the community or I'd like to ask the community if, if you can imagine experiencing that as an African-American community. And then if you can, can go belong beyond that, can you imagine experiencing that as a black woman? Because as a black woman, you are seeing that as a sister, you're seeing it as an auntie, a cousin, 
a mother, a spouse, if you are a black woman and you are experiencing what happened to Breonna Taylor, you're experiencing that as someone that you can see yourself in those shoes. And so racism is an enduring persistent source of stress for black women. I know that, that there's a belief that black women are strong and, and, and that's been going on for centuries that, that we just are this, this force but being a black woman in America is, is, is traumatic. Racial discrimination is associated with psychological distress and psychological distress among people of color is linked to substance abuse. Um, if you're suffering from trauma and it, it manifests itself in multiple ways, um, anxiety, stress, depression, PTSD, the list goes on and on and on. So I think it's fair to say that we can, we can agree that the racism is trauma, right? Racial trauma also goes unaddressed because there's no cultural competence. People are unaware of their perspective and their own biases. And they don't understand that the worldviews of black women and their views are vastly different. There's a lack of understanding from clinicians and clients and treatment, various support groups. Let's, let's pause for a minute and, and, and really get an understanding of what it means to be culturally competent. What that, what that, that means is, is that you understand that the experiences of Black women are different than your own. You, you understand that not only are they different, but that these experiences play out across all spectrums of life, all of them. But because there's an absence of cultural competence, there's a lack of consideration and there's a lack of attention that is really given to the issues that black women face. I was working um, for a treatment facility last year, private, facility, um, private insurance. And I think we, um, we were looking at the demographics of the population that we served. And I think we averaged maybe anywhere between four to six black women a year, a year. And it just so happened that while I was there, a black young woman came into treatment. She was there for alcohol. But, you know, she had to go through a lot more than just facing the struggles that she was having because there was no reference from the other clients and clinicians on where she was coming from. The microaggressions were everywhere for her. And it was tough. I mean, you know, one of the biggest, the biggest things that she dealt with um, was, can I touch your hair? You know, and um, she struggled with that. She really, really, it was painful for me to watch it because she just didn't know what to do with the questions of, can I touch your hair? What is it like where you come from? Was crack your drug of choice? I mean, these are the, you know, just some of the things that I witnessed just in casual conversation. I don't even know if the clients at the time realized the damage that was being done. But it was difficult for her to find her footing. Not only did she have to deal with her addiction problem, but she also had to deal with the lack of insensitivity and the lack of empathy and the lack of understanding for her experience. And so I think it's, it's, we, can, we can see how racism can be a recovery threatening issue. What do we mean when we say that? We first need to accept the fact that treatment facilities operate within institutions that have a historical race, racist practice. I mean, look at our healthcare systems, look at our education systems, look at our employment systems, look at the media, look at criminal justice, right? There's a racial disparity in the quality of healthcare, then that affects treatment. 
if there is a racial disparity or since there's a racial disparity in employment, this creates economic barriers to accessing private health insurance, which restricts access to quality substance treatment centers. Since there's a racial disparity in the criminal justice system, the criminalization of substance abuse for black women definitely affects treatment. So you can have the same offense, the very same offense, and the facts show that white women get treatment and black women get jail time. When we talk about whiteness showing up in the recovery rooms, what does that mean? I mean, what does it look like? I mean, obviously it shows up in white fragility, it shows up in privilege, it shows up in ways that whites are always centered. But you know what, in a, in a nutshell, it shows up as a way of checking down and upholding the norms of the white experience. And I mean, I, I know we can't, we can't do a panel or, or a poll right now, but I guess I would ask, ask you to just consider these questions and I'm just gonna throw some questions out there for you to think about. The first question is, do your recovery spaces make room for black women? Do they make the room? Meaning, is racial trauma ever discussed? What's happening in America isn't happening in a vacuum. So it doesn't necessarily have to be discussed by black women. Do white women bring up the discussion? I mean, there's, there are, are things that are happening that are traumatic, that are socially being driven right now. People are in the streets fighting for equality. Do those topics come up? Do we ever have conversations about what's going on? In your recovery spaces, are racist remarks, even in the form of microaggressions, are they ever made? Even jokingly. And when they are made, are they addressed? Are inappropriate statements or behaviors called out? This is what we're talking about. When statements like, I'm colorblind, you know, I don't, I don't see color or addiction's about seeing our commonality. It's not about our differences. It's principles over personalities. Don't bring politics into the rooms. Now, all of this stuff really, really minimizes the experience of black women. It prevents us from being our authentic selves, you know, from being free to really discuss the anger and the hurt that we feel from constantly breathing the air of oppression in this country. White women, consider your impact in the spaces of recovery. Who gets called on to share? Who are the leaders, the secretaries, the treasurers at the meetings and the support groups that you attend? Is attention paid when black women share? Is there consideration for black mental health? Or is there a lack of validation and a lack of inclusion? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out and say this, and you know, there are, there are a lot of black institutions, but I'm gonna say that I think they're created in this country, country because there's no reconciliation. If we had more reconciliation, we wouldn't need black only schools and black only this and black meetings. We just, <laughs> we just wouldn't need it. But I, I think that we can begin to reconcile the recovery space when we admit to each other that being invited doesn't always mean that you're included. And we can work to change that when we start to examine the structures of leadership in recovery spaces, who's in control? Who's being included? Who's being asked to do things? And what are the power dynamics? When we learn to be open to conversations like this one, that's how we begin to heal the space. And to my black women in the room, where y'all at? Let me just say that recovery is not just for white women. 
We need to get involved. And I know that it's difficult because a lot of times we are the only face in the room. But I'm gonna say this, someone has to be the first domino. It's not always easy, but we're preparing and we're laying the groundwork for the next person that needs to come. And if you have the strength to do it, to show up in a room where it's just you, do it and continue to do it so that white women eventually recognize that we belong to be, we belong there. I was at a, a seminar last year and um, maybe it was about 200, 250 people. Um, and I was one of just a few black faces that were in the room. And a session came up that was, that was taught by Dr. Eddie Moore, um, phenomenal, phenomenal speaker. If we can put him in the chat, I would encourage you to look him up and take some of his trainings. Um, but it was on power, privilege, and addiction. And it was challenging because most of the people in the room were there really to talk about the opioid epidemic. That was it. There were parents there that had lost children. There were people there that were in recovery themselves. There were executive directors of treatment facilities. And the challenge was that no matter what we were talking about, the conversation would always go back to the opioid epidemic. And of course, we were there to talk about all forms of, of, of addiction, alcoholism, um, you know, how you know, different communities are, are being marginalized and not included. And so when Dr. Eddie Moore got up to talk, the, the, the room just wasn't prepared. They just were not ready to discuss white privilege in addiction treatment. And they begin to get angry. And the, the room began to get hostile. And I began, I was like, well, what is, what is this about? I mean, I just, I was, I guess I was surprised because here we are in a recovery space with people that have a shared experience of healing and know what it's like to be ostracized and know what it's like to be looked down upon and know what it's like to be left out and abandoned and, and, and just left for dead. And they couldn't hear that black people are suffering and that black communities have been ravaged and that there is a disparity between how the opioid epidemic is handled and how the crack ep epidemic was handled. They just weren't ready to hear it. And what stuck with me was in this room were some of the country's brightest stars assembled to mobilize and strategize on how to tackle the looming problem of addiction. And so I think as we, we go through this conversation, I just wanna congratulate everyone that's here for being willing to have this conversation. It's not always an easy conversation to have, but it's necessary. It's just to remember that although we don't have shared experiences exactly, that we do have shared humanity. Thank you so much. Frantically over here taking down notes. Um, so much that you said, Sherry, really stood out, um, you know, from the beginning, explaining the news and seeing this. And a while ago, I had written an article for another recovery site. And the closest that I could come to it was, what was it, two years ago when Brett Kavanaugh was having his, um, his hearing. And I remember being in work and I work in Vermont, it's predominantly white. And so many of the women in the office were so nervous. So you could just feel the tension because unfortunately alarming amount of women have um, been sexually abused, assaulted. And there was this, this tension around there. And I, and I thought it myself and I was like, oh, this is kind of what it's like to be a black person. And, you know, every month or this year, every week on the news, there's just something 
going on that that's pressing at us that's that's bringing us that's down that's emotional and charged and I use that example you know you might not be going through that same exact experience but this is the closest thing that I could think of um, and a few person people were like yeah I could I could understand that even though I'm not a not a black woman so you know thank you for for bringing that up and also the fact too that it is like it is part of us it covers everything it's like that that fascia over the skin, you know, racism, it just, it gets into everywhere. And I love what you said, until we reconcile it, there's going to be these differences that we have, the separation and not separation from a like, yes, it's great to be with women. Yes, it's great to be with black women. Yes, it's great to be with other people from the LGBTQ community, but just like, we feel like we need to, to be safe. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Just so many great things. Um, the next person who is going to be speaking is Dr. Valerie Mason John, AKA Vimla Sara, AKA such a soulful, soulful human being. We go back a little ways too. So leaping forward a few years into my recovery, I went through a recovery school program. And what was awesome was they were also realizing this, the differences that people have in recovery. And so they had different groups and there was a group for black and mixed women and she led that. And it was the first time being in recovery that I was in a space maybe with six other women who were also black. And then it wasn't really until years later this, this summer that I got to have that experience as well. Um, so that's where we've been. And I've been watching her do her things and to get into what she's done. Uh, she is an award-winning author of nine books her most recent published this year is I Am Still Your Negro, an homage to James Baldwin. She is the co-author and co-founder of Eight Step Recovery, using Buddhist teachings to overcome addiction with meetings in several countries, so check it out. She is also the co-founder of Mindfulness-Based Addiction Recovery, an accredited four-week online program and the Train the Trainer program. And she is dedicating the rest of her life to the upliftment of Black people and co-leads a healing circle for African descendant people on the last Sunday of every month with Insight LA. So like I said at the beginning, very, very busy women. <laughs> for her discussion, coming home to our beautiful bodies, she will be talking about the concept of nobody is home, the shaman's five questions, and the five basic needs of the heart. So. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn. And I just want to say that um, for me, when you was in my group, just to have somebody reflect back my dark skin was healing. Yeah, very, very healing. Um, and thank you for my introduction and all the work that you do. So I'm going to begin with a track by Sweet Honey and the Rock. Just see it as a, as a meditation. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a parentless child. And sometimes I feel alone, a long way from home. And home is in the body. And it's so difficult for us as black women, black people in the world to be home in the body, to even be home in the countries in the diaspora. And I'm going to begin with a poem because one of the reasons why we are a long way from home is because, is because of our historical trauma. I am Africa. I am Africa, polished by the Saharan sun, blue, black, red, black, brown, black, Blonde haired, blue eyed, thick lipped, swinging in my hips, swimming in my jeans, ebonized like my Madagascar trees. I am Africa, a galaxy of 54 countries, nine territories, two disputed states, orating dialects of over 3,000 overtures. I am language literate, language articulate, laughing, drumming, dancing, a cappella voices telling my story. I am Africa. Diamonds, bauxite, iron, shaken, taken from my red hot earth, 
blasted from my mountains, sold by the corporates, ransacked, pillaged, death, blood leech from my peoples. I am Africa, Africa. Pharaohs, gods, idols, kings, queens, pyramids, temples, dictators, child soldiers, rebels, Muslims, Christians, traditional, amputation, starvation, ethnic cleansing. I am seeking reparations. I am Africa. Pillaged from my villages, chipped from my ancestral line, chained to my sisters and brothers, cattled and sardined as we journeyed the middle passage, dead and alive. We fashioned to fit into the colonizer's narcissistic mold. I am Africa. Desert, jungle, forest, mountain, ocean, urbanized, gentrified, petrified forest, a kingdom of nature, a safari of animals missing their ivory horn skins. I am Africa, the mother of all peoples, the mother of all nations, birthing the first humanoid, civilizing the first society, robbed of my riches, compensated with poverty, famine, AIDS, infant mortality, war. I am Africa, Africa, Africa. What is there left to take? Africa? Africa? You can never take Africa because Africa is a spirit that always roams my continent. I am Africa, 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 Africa. Some of us can't even come home to Africa. Some of us don't even know who our grandfathers are or our great grandfathers or our grandmothers or our great grandmothers because we were taken from our land. We are stateless indigenous people. And this is what we walk into the room with. We walk into the room with historical trauma. We walk into the room disembodied. We are not home in our bodies because of the trauma. And there are these questions that the shamans would ask. And in African culture, we had the shamans, we have the healers. And these questions, the first question would be, when did you stop singing? When did you stop singing? When someone called you a nigger, told you you were ugly and laughed at you because of your hair? Or for you white people, when did you stop singing? When you heard parents or white people insult, insult black people? When you heard white people call us names? This is when I stopped singing. Sticks and stones. Sticks and stones did break my bones and words did always hurt me. My white mother told me never to moan. She was old and cold as stone. I was young and scared as she. Sticks and stones did break my bones. I had no friends, so played alone. I hated myself for being an adoptee. My white mother told me never to moan. A white child broke my jawbone. He pulled me down onto my knees. Sticks and stones did break my bones. One day I was found crying on my own. White children came over and pissed on me. My white mother told me never to moan. When there was blood on the curbstone, my white mother tried to protect me. Sticks and stones did break my bones, but she still told me never to moan. The second question the shaman would ask when somebody was brought to them who was spiritually, physically, mentally ill. And I would say that the vast majority of black people in the diaspora, the scattering of Africa in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in England, 
in Brazil and many other places. We were scattered all over. We weren't colonized on our lands. We were taken. Our languages robbed from us. Yes, so many of us. That's the intergenerational trauma. Yeah. And they would ask, when did you stop dancing? When did you stop dancing? When your white friend told you that they couldn't play with you because you were black? When your white friend started to call you names? When did we stop singing? When did we stop dancing? And for you white people, when did you stop dancing? When did you stop playing with black children? When did you start thinking I am different from these black people? When did you stop? Think about it. Well, when I stopped singing, my father's prayer. My father who art in the universe, what on earth is your name? Will you ever come? Thy will be home, dead or alive. Give me day or night your daily name and I will forgive your sons, forgiving all those who have colluded with your sins and lead me not into more unhappiness, but deliver me from this pain. For thou have the power and knowledge forever and ever of all men. Are you aware that so many black families do not have the fathers there because they have been incarcerated. Black men are the most incarcerated race in the world, be they in prisons or in mental health institutions or living on the streets. Yeah. And those black men are our brothers, are our sons, are our nephews, are our husbands. The next question is, when did you stop being enchanted by your own story? When did you stop being enchanted by your own story? When we as black people were made to feel inferior, when we as black people did not see our images represented in society, when we as black people were sitting at the same table as you white people, but we could not have a voice, when we as black people were sitting in the same rooms as you and we were told to be quiet, do not bring the topic of racism into the rooms of recovery, when did we stop being enchanted by our own story. And for you white people, when you were told you had white privilege, when you were told that you were part of the systemic racism, when did we stop being enchanted by our own stories? And the third or the fourth question is, when did we stop dwelling in the sweet territory, territory of silence? When we heard our black brothers, sons and daughters and sisters had been killed or maimed by the police, when we wake up every morning and look at the news and we hear that there's been another public lynching of a black person, or for you white people, when did you stop dwelling in the sweet territory of silence? When you saw the uprisings in the streets, when you saw statues being toppled, statues being taken down, 
when you were asked to step down from your position because a black person needed to take that position? When did you stop dwelling in the sweet territory of silence? Another one bites the dust. Strobed red and blue, crazed and flooded by police light. She cradles her 18 year old son, stiffening on her breasts, murdered by cops in a gunfight. Resisting wrongful arrest, she wells, my son is dead, not even old enough to graduate. Smothered, covered in his bloodshed, killed by fear and senseless hate, collapses and uncontrollably blubbers, cradling, soothing, screaming, lifeless. Who cares? Just another black body dead in the gutter. One more death, corrupt and senseless. Another one bites the dust. And I add a fifth question as a healer, as a Buddhist teacher, as a shaman. When did we stop breathing? Did you stop breathing as you heard me speak? Did you stop breathing when you heard Sherry speak? When did you stop breathing? And this is how we come home to the body because when we stop breathing, there's a restriction of air and we get activated and we get temporary brain damage. And you as white people go into a version, I'm not racist, what do you mean by white privilege? Can we have a conversation with you? And you stop listening. And we as black people, Stop breathing every time a police car passes by us. Every time we see a policeman, we stop breathing. And we have to learn to come home to the body. And how do we do that? And we can begin to do that by cultivating the five basic needs of the heart. So let's just all take a moment to pause and to settle where you're sitting or standing and begin to pay attention to your beautiful body. Each and every one of us has a beautiful body. It's just that sometimes people don't use their beautiful body in the most appropriate way. But we all have a beautiful body. So pay attention to it. It's a body experiencing restriction, tension. It's a body experiencing some expansion and breathe, allow yourself to breathe, to take the medicine of the breath so you can come home to the body. Affection, cultivating affection towards the self. Yes, really allow yourself to have the affection for those of you who are Black, Indigenous, people of colour. Give yourself affection. Yes, really. Give yourself some kindness and love. And any voice that's in your head saying, I don't deserve this, just tell it to relax and give yourself affection. And those of you who are in white bodies, Ask the guilt voices to step aside a moment. Ask the guilt voices to relax and give yourself some affection because guilt will get in the way of you turning towards this systemic racism 
in the world. Give yourself some affection and appreciation, cultivating appreciation towards the self. Appreciate yourself for staying here and listening to us. Those of you who are black, indigenous, people of color, this has been a lot for you to hear. You've heard Sherry, you've heard Jocelyn, you've heard me, you're gonna hear Esther, you're gonna hear Taryn, it's a lot and you've stayed and listened. And you as white people who are still here, you've stayed and listened, you haven't run away. So just give yourself some appreciation. And now moving into acceptance, just accepting what is, accepting the body that we came into the world with and knowing that we have different jobs to do. And you as white people, we cannot do this on our own. Harriet Tubman could not have left, led the slave revolt on her own. She had white people who helped. We need you to turn away from the guilt and step into your power with acceptance. And we, as black indigenous people of color who are here on the call, let go of the past and the future and just accept, not resignation and accept the beautiful being that you are right here in this moment. And we just end with allowing, allowing anything to arise in your experience. Just taking a few seconds to touch in to your experience. Ashe, a homia takwase, all my relations. Blessings. Mm. Thank you so much. That was that was powerful. Powerful for powerful for everyone. Um, when did you stop breathing? I remember that is a question that you asked a lot in the group. I can think of the times too that one of the harshest things someone had ever said to me, which I might share in the next meeting, that still sticks with me. And I also know that there is beautiful parts of me, but it's very hard. It's, it's hard. I thank you so much for, for touching in on the ancestral trauma the generational trauma. You know, I, I play a lot in the spiritual mindset world and it's, I find it so interesting the amount of white spiritual teachers and, and healers and leaders who talk about this trauma, but then in the next breath, they're like, why can't black people get over their stuff? Um, it was really illuminating the differences. So thank you to speaking of that and that we all have it, um, that we all have different paths to walk, that we can all help each other, that we can all heal together. That's something I need to be reminded of um, it was just so, it was so beautiful. And what I love about this, and hopefully other people love about this, is we're getting so many different perspectives. When Sherry talked, I felt like I, I loved school. I loved learning. If I could just pay tuition for the rest of my life, I would. You know, her class was very like economics, sociology, taking the notes. Yours felt like this poetic psychology class. I'm a writing major. It brought me back to those slam poems. Um, and now we are going to move into Esther's discussion and we have focused on getting into the body and I know a lot of her work stems EFT of being in the body. So it is very exciting. Moving on to her, admittedly Esther is the one person that I didn't know before this event. I saw her face around. So I was very excited to see her on the list of people that would be talking. And when we met in group instantly, I felt I connected. I thought this is a woman that has this beautiful blend of compassion, 
sorry, compassion and strength. She's a firecracker. And before this meeting, she shared what her um, sign was, her astrological sign. And it's not my sign, but it's my rising sign. So I was like, okay, this is, this all makes sense now. So Esther Nicholson, she is the author of Soul Recovery, 12 Keys to Healing Dependence. And she has turned her incredible journey from addiction to freedom into a practical program that heals the root causes of unworthiness, shame, and trauma. Her life-changing program, Soul Recovery, The Roadmap, bridges the gap between the 12 steps of recovery and universal, universal spiritual practices that have assisted thousands to living a new inner freedom beyond their wildest dreams. Esther's unique approach reveals the spiritual depth and healing power of the 12 steps and removes the stigma of addiction. And her discussion, overcoming racial trauma through the steps in EFT, along with those topics, she's also going to be talking about how in order to heal, we must first be aware and acknowledge what we need to heal from and how we can get free of ancestral, familial, and generational pain so we can stand in our authentic selves. So it's going to build so beautifully on the discussion we had. So please help me welcome Esther. Good afternoon, beloveds. I'm so honored to be with you today. And I just am so grateful for this panel, Jocelyn, Sherry, Taryn, Dr. Valerie Mason, she recovers. And I'm so grateful for you for taking this leap and this courageous step to be in this critical conversation today. There's something that Sherry said in her, in her presentation about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Armand Aubrey, imagining them as a sister. You, you being their sister, mother, cousin, auntie, best friend. Put yourself in the place of a mother, a sister, a cousin, having lost your beloved in that way. There are so many people who are appalled by animal abuse, as we all should be, but there are people who are more sensitive to abusing and killing animals than they are to the murders of unarmed black people. I just want you to think about that for a moment. How we have campaigns and um, the rights of, of, of animals and all of that, which absolutely is correct and it should be because life is life no matter what, but that there are so many people on this planet that's more concerned with that than being concerned and outraged about the killing of black men and women. So I just really wanted to revisit that part of Sherry's presentation. But I wanna to talk to you about healing racial trauma through the 12 steps and the emotional freedom technique, which we affectionately call EFT. First of all, what is trauma? The dictionary states that trauma is an emotional shock following a stressful event or an emotional or physical injury, which sometimes leads to long-term neurosis. And I would venture to say that racism, bias and discrimination causes deep emotional and physical injury resulting in shock and neurosis. Wouldn't you? It goes on to state that neurosis is a relatively mild mental illness involving symptoms of stress, depression, anxiety and obsessive behavior but not a radical loss of touch with reality. Well, I don't think that neurosis caused by racial trauma results in mild mental illness. I believe it screws us up on a molecular level and affects our lives in ways that we are not even fully aware of. Neurosis of any kind can indeed 
cause a radical loss of, of, of being in touch with reality. Have you ever been diagnosed with something in one area of your body, but it affected so many other areas of your mind and body? I have. I had candida overgrowth, which is a gut issue that affected my thinking, my sleep, my heart rate, my sex drive, and my emotions. And I tried for a long time to treat the symptoms unsuccessfully, I might add, because the root cause of all of those symptoms had not been addressed and healed. And that's what racial trauma does. It permeates every area of your life, even when you're not aware of why you are so anxious, depressed, angry, resentful, and suffer from emotions of shame, or why you keep repeating destructive patterns to numb out those unresolved emotions. Everyone attending this critical conversation today has suffered from racial trauma. Our senses have been shocked into neurosis. Trauma causes us to forget who we are and what we were created to be. It disconnects us from our God self, our higher self, the universe. It disconnects us from home, as Dr. Valerie so eloquently put it. It disconnects you from your very soul because it creates so much static on the line in our minds and it creates so many mental walls that we are knocked off balance emotionally and physically, and we become energetically disaligned with our own divine, magnificent self home. Trauma causes you to disconnect from your innate sense, your innate identity of safety of safety, can I get an amen to just feeling safe? Many of us walk around every single day, 24 hours a day with this low grade anxiety and desperation. And we just go on walking through our lives like not even really understanding what's going on on the inside. Can we just say yes to feeling safe in our bodies? in our minds, in our beingness. Did you know that safety is your birthright? But when you feel threatened, you totally go into, you, you totally disconnect from that very natural part of yourself because we're always in fight or flight mode, even when we don't recognize it. So for black women attending this conference today, our sense of safety and our true identity was literally ripped away from us hundreds of years ago when our ancestors were taken into slavery. We inherited those deep wounds of the indignity, cruelty, and inhumanity of slavery. And no matter how much we may have found success, happiness, and fulfillment in so many areas of our lives, we still suffer not only from our own unique and individual traumas, traumatic experiences, but we are stuck in familial, ancestral, and generational trauma that has been imprinted upon our unconscious minds and in our very cells, upon our very cells. And every time we witness another unjust act upon one of our black brothers or sisters and sisters, we are re-triggered and we are re-injured. The Band-Aid is ripped off the wound that was never completely healed in the first place. And we bleed out again and again and again. Racial trauma. Every time you are turned down for a job or a promotion, you are reminded falsely that you're not good enough because of the color of your skin. Every time many of us have seen a black man with a white woman, 
We are reminded falsely that we're not good enough for our own men. Those painful thoughts may not even be in the field of your conscious awareness, but on the unconscious level, deep down inside for a lot of you, the thought is there. And you are again re-triggered and re-injured, bleeding out in so many areas of your life. There are some of you who are too afraid to go for the promotion or the job because the color of your skin, because of the color of your skin, and you feel defeated before you even step up to the plate. How many of you can relate to that? Just take a moment and breathe here, inhaling deeply. Just take that in. Just think about that for a moment. I can remember a time when that was my experience, where I didn't even bother to apply. I didn't even bother to go for the promotion or to go for the job because on an innate level that I wasn't even aware of consciously, I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel worthy enough because racial trauma causes you to forget who you are and who you were created to be. Your true identity as an expression of the infinite, as an expression of life has been emotionally and sometimes physically beaten out of you. I remember a couple of years ago, sitting in my office, tapping on myself, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later in this presentation, because I was attempting to release the deep core belief that I wasn't good enough or worthy. Because I just found myself just getting stuck and feeling like a hamster on a hamster wheel, like just move, you know, pushing and pushing and working so hard and getting nowhere. And I knew that it had to do with a deep core belief that I wasn't worthy, that I wasn't good enough in the shame and all that stuff. And as I'm tapping on myself, a memory that wasn't my own rose to the top of my awareness and said, I'm just a little nigger girl and I don't belong in the big house. And I was like, what? Whoa, this memory just knocked me off my chair because it wasn't a, it wasn't a memory that I was cognizant of. It was a memory that, had, that was way, 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 way down deep in my subconscious mind. It was the memory of my ancestors or maybe even of another lifetime, I don't know. I couldn't believe it. And then, but then I understood, I finally understood that the feelings of unworthiness that I had been suffering from weren't only based on my own unique belief system, based on my own unique experiences of trauma, but were the memories, perceptions, and traumas of my ancestors that were, had been imprinted upon my subconscious mind. And when you have memories and traumas imprinted upon your subconscious mind, no matter where they came from, when you try to move forward in life, it's like having one foot on the brake and another foot on the accelerator. You're pushing and pushing and you're trying to move forward with your life, but you're not getting anywhere. We must heal the cause before we can heal the effect. So think about it. Where are you just working your butt off to heal? but you keep finding yourself making a U-turn right back into the same painful, debilitating, hopeless and traumatized emotions and self-destructive patterns. And you're asking yourself, what the heck is wrong with me? Am I crazy? No, you're not crazy, beloved. You're stuck. You're stuck in unconscious and unhealed programs of racial trauma, as well as your own individual traumas, which is a virus in your hard drive. Unhealed emotions and beliefs are addictions, which then create other symptoms of addictions. And once we heal the root cause, we can heal the effect. We can heal our experiences, but not before. 
We must heal the cause before we can heal the effect. It's nothing personal. It's just spiritual law and it applies to everyone. And we can't depend on others, my sisters. We can't depend on others to change in order to reclaim our freedom and clarity. Our freedom comes from the inside. And once you do heal the deep rooted cause, you can awaken, you can wake up then. I think Valerie spoke about that. You can, we can awaken to our divine nature as the beloved goddess the magnificent, empowered, confident, joyful, safe, successful women that life has created you to be. And to my beloved white sisters in the audience today, you too have been traumatized because you were created out of the same essence as your black sisters. You were created out of love and you were created to love all life equally, but you've forgotten. In the movie, The Help, and if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. The maid played by Viola Davis was Nanny, or Mammy, as we were called back in the day, to a little white girl. This little girl loved her so much and only knew the maid through the eyes of love and oneness. That's all she knew, she was pure innocence. She was pure love. Her parents and the culture and the environment she was born into, on the other hand, started to infiltrate her mind with the inward and changed her perception of how she saw the nanny, of how she was to grow up and, and view black people. She was created out of innocence and unconditional love but she was in an environment where she learned racism, separation and superiority and took on beliefs that weren't even her own beliefs. So in addressing specifically my white sisters in the audience today, how many beliefs, perceptions and knee jerk reactions do you have about black people that aren't even really beliefs of your own? They were imprinted upon you. And sometimes you think in ways and you're like, where did that thought come from? Like, that's not me. I don't really think that way. And perhaps you don't, but it's deeply embedded inside of you. Just like as black women, our ancestors pain and shame and indignity and fear is imprinted upon us. How have you, my white sisters, experienced trauma in these past six months because your hidden beliefs have been exposed and now you feel guilt, shame, and anger. And then you feel shame about having those emotions. We have not invited you here, beloveds, to shame or blame you. You were invited here. You were imprinted by your ancestors, just like we were imprinted by ours. We invited you here not to shame you, but to wake you, to awaken you, to wake you up to your own racial trauma and to offer you solutions to heal it so that you can return home to who you really are, the little white girl in the help before she learned something different that was just about pure love before she was brainwashed to believe she was superior and others were less than she was because of the color of their skin. We're here to invite you home. The moment that you were imprinted with the belief system of superiority and racial thoughts on any level, you were traumatized. You were traumatized because the ingrained belief that you are better than black women, that you should be afraid of black men or, or uh, were taught to judge us by the color of our skin versus the content of our character. 
your emotional system was traumatized because it is out of alignment with the innocence and sense of oneness that is your true nature as a creation of life. And your life of neurosis began. Chronic depression, anxiety, unworthiness, so forth. That not only has its foundation in your unique experiences of trauma, but have been imprinted upon you by your ancestors. Take a breath here. Take that in. Can you relate to that? Just take a moment, contemplate that. Let everything I've said so far, just, just be with it. See how it sits with you. I'd love to hear what's coming up for you. And I'll give you information at the end of this presentation where you can reach out and share with me because I'd love to address whatever it is that's coming up for you right now. So racial trauma, how do we heal it? Since the George Floyd, Floyd incident, the world has been galvanized in a powerful way. This conference is an example of how that experience has catapulted the world into action for equality and justice. But we must go deeper. We can create powerful changes in the external world. And many of those changes are being made. But until the internal and unconscious healing occurs, those changes will not be sustainable. My work is soul recovery, the roadmap home to the authentic self. And it bridges the gap between the 12 steps of recovery and universal spiritual principles. This process gets us back to our authentic and higher self that has no discrimination, that doesn't know racism, that doesn't know bias, that doesn't know separation, that has no boundaries, that doesn't know otherness. It only knows oneness. And I'd like to briefly go over four of the 12 steps to healing racial trauma. And again, we'll give you information at the end of this presentation as to how you can access these steps and EFT in a deeper way. So I just want you to just grab your wrist right now, which is an acupuncture point. Inhale deeply. Blow it out. And say peace. Just take in these steps to healing racial trauma. Step one. I admit that I am powerless over my deeply ingrained traumatic experiences, beliefs and thought patterns of bias, racism and discrimination. And my life has become unmanageable. This is for our black women and our white women. I admit, just take it in, I admit that I am powerless over my deeply ingrained traumatic experiences beliefs and thought patterns of bias, racism, and discrimination, and my life has become unmanageable. Step two, I am coming to believe that a power greater than myself, which is the very nature of my true self, can restore me to a consciousness of oneness, equality, and inclusivity of all people. I am coming to believe that this power within me can restore me to sanity. I am willing and I am ready. Step three, I made a decision to turn my familial, generational and ancestral traumas patterns, memories, and unconscious programming of racism over to the care of God as I understand God or whatever it is you're comfortable calling it. I am willing to turn my limited beliefs, my limited wounded beliefs about my higher power, myself and all of my sisters over to the care of God as I am now coming into a higher, more expanded understanding of oneness. Step four.
Step four, I have made a fearless and rigorous, rigorously honest inventory of my beliefs, fears, patterns, and actions toward myself and anyone who thinks, looks, behaves, and believes differently than myself. Just breathe that in. Just these four steps is gonna set you free. And I'll let you know, again, how to access the rest steps five through 12 at the end of this presentation. But I want to share with you right now, steps eight and nine. I just wanna skip to steps eight and nine because we're gonna segue into a, a, an experience, a powerful experience of that after my presentation. Steps eight and nine states, I made a list to the best of my ability to all of those I have harmed. Step nine, I make amends. I clear away all negative energy. I bring the broken places to, I, I heal the broken places by becoming whole. And I make amends to those I have harmed, except when to do so would cause more confusion and pain to them or others. Our beloved Taryn Strong is going to actually give us an, a, a powerful demonstration of that from her heart after this presentation. So these steps bring to the, bring to the surface mind and clear up years of misperceptions, beliefs, fears, and patterns that on a conscious level, you may not even be aware of. And they're going to bring you home to your authentic self and set you free. To get the rest of the steps and to learn all things soul recovery to bring us home to our authentic self, please feel free to just go to estermail.com so that you have access to this information. I'll be more than happy to send you a, a PDF of the 12 steps to healing racial trauma. Now let's look briefly at how EFT heals not only racial trauma, but all trauma. EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique and is a combination of Chinese acupuncture and spiritual psychology. It targets energy or meridian points on your body that holds unresolved trauma, perceptions, and life diminishing emotions. This process is like a laser beam that brings to your conscious awareness and deinstalls all the traumatic experience, perceptions, and emotional programs that are deeply embedded in your hard drive, which is the unconscious mind. When the memories of those traumatic experiences and perceptions are deinstalled and removed through the steps and tapping, emotional freedom technique, you're restored to your true essence of light because that's who you are. You are light. This process gets you unstuck, unblocked, and aligns you with the natural flow of life, of oneness. I'd like to give you a demonstration of that. So what I'd like to invite everyone to do right now, we're gonna do a little bit of tapping EFT. Maybe some of you have never heard of it before and you're, you have no experience with it and that's totally fine. I'm just gonna lead you to, through it for like maybe two or three minutes, okay? So first of all, I want you to think of the racial trauma that you've experienced. Let it just come up in your emotions. Don't try to edit it. Just let all of the anger, the rage, the shame, the inequality, the unjustness of it, just come up in your consciousness. And for our, our, our white sisters, maybe you're having that same outrage and that same anxiety and that same fear, or maybe you're feeling attacked or like it's not fair, you're not racist and you're so sick of this, I don't know. Whatever the emotion is around this, I want you to just let it come up fully in your consciousness, get mad. Feel the anxiety, feel the rage, feel it. And on a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being the most fearful, the, mo most, the, the most painful, I want you to just rate yourself from zero to 10, where are you? Wherever you are, 
Hold on to that for a moment. Grab your wrist. And your wrist is an acupuncture point. Inhale deeply. Exhale and say peace. And now you're gonna bring your two index fingers to your third eye and you're gonna start tapping on your third eye. Feel all of those emotions, everything that you feel right now. And I want you to just repeat after me, eliminating all emotions of hopelessness, helplessness and powerlessness. Inside of your eyebrow, letting go of all shame and blame. Side of your eye, releasing and letting go all emotions of rage, resentment, fear, unworthiness, not enoughness, just letting it go. Under your eye, I'm ready to come home. Letting go. Your chin, it's safe. It's safe to let go. Collarbone, letting go. Grab your wrist, inhale deeply. Exhale, peace. Now I want you to think of something that makes you really, really happy. We're interrupting the programming and the wiring in your brain. Think of something that just brings you joy. You're so happy, you're so turned on about it. Just feel it, feel as if it's already happening, just feel it. When you get it, grab your wrist, inhale deeply, exhale, peace. Now I want you to go back to the outrage, the shame, all those feelings that you were feeling a few moments ago. See where you are on a scale from zero to 10 now. Has it shifted a little bit? Are you still a 10? Are you still an eight? Are you still a six? Or has, are you starting to feel some spaciousness a little bit? If not, let's just go here, letting it go, releasing and letting it go. Now I'm gonna do something really silly with you because we're gonna to totally disrupt that wiring. So just play with me here. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to repeat after me, okay? you to quack like a duck quack 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 <laughs> your chin woof, 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 like a dog collarbone letting it go letting it all go grab your wrist inhale deeply exhale peace tap on your third eye i'm awake i'm awake i remember who i am I remember who I am, black woman. I remember who you are, white girl. I remember who you are, black woman. We are one. I am enough. I am centered, I am clear. I am outrageously amazing. I'm enough. Grab your wrist. Inhale deeply and exhale on peace. Awesome. Just check in with yourself and see if your energy has shifted at all. That was a very abbreviate, abbreviated version of EFT. Of course, we go much deeper than that. But for the sake of time, I just wanted to give you an example. I just wanted to give you an experience of what it can do. So in closing, the 12 steps to healing racism or the 12 steps on any level for anything, I believe, restores us to sanity. EFT restores us to sanity. And it reveals in the sanity, the clarity that you are not victims of racism. We have been victimized by racism, bias and discrimination, but victim is not your name and it is not your identity. Take your name back, reconnect to your innate goddess power. She's waiting for you. 
She may have been injured, but she's not broken. Use these tools to come home to the real you. The world did not give you your true identity and the world cannot take it away. Go forth and be the black and white beautiful goddesses that you were created to be. And get you home to your empowered, confident, centered, safe, and safe badass goddessness who stands for oneness, justice, and equality for all life, no matter what race, what creed, what color, what you are, we are one. Come home, welcome home. We invite you home. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Um, that was beautiful. My face feels good. I feel shifted. There was so much you touched on and especially the idea of being re-triggered constantly, re-traumatized, but that you have still provided us with tools to move through it, tools that we can do separately and then come together um, as one. It is beautiful. I loved what you said to victimized, but not victims, that subtle difference that does not deny what has happened, but is allowing us to move forward. And what's really going to be so helpful today and thank you all for, for sticking on, is hearing Taryn share her amends. I'm, as someone who has been in a path that does amends, has received amends, has a given amends, and it's such a powerful thing. It's so unique. So I am so excited, honored, grateful to hear what you have to say with yours. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Wow, what an absolutely powerful, potent, and incredible afternoon where I live. This has been, and I knew it would be. So thank you everybody for your presence. And most importantly, thank you to Esther, Dr. Valerie, Sherry, and Jocelyn for your presence and for your presentations. And thank you to all of you for leading this event and this panel and for leading this critical conversation. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my mother and co-founder Don Nickel, who you all met at the beginning of this, our foundation board and all of our volunteers, when I say that hosting this critical conversation is truly one of the most important things that we have ever done to date. And we've been busy over the years, we have done a lot. This is the most important. On a personal note, this is one of the most meaningful things I've ever done. As my mother said at the beginning of this webinar, we rewrote our intentions and guiding principles this summer to include one that reads, we do our individual work in order to create and hold healing spaces for everyone. All women deserve recovery. And we strongly believe that we will only do better as an organization when we all as individuals in this community do our own work. And doing our own anti-racism work as well as other anti-oppression work has got to be at the top of the things for us to work on. We can begin with an apology, but we must move into action to truly make amends. So first, as an individual, I acknowledge that I owe an apology to the black community. I want and need to apologize for not showing up sooner. I'm sorry for not taking action and for hesitating because I was afraid I would do it wrong. I'm sorry for not acknowledging my white privilege, for allowing myself to stay numb and living under without questioning the white supremacist, capitalistic, patriarch patriarchal framework. A framework and way of being that told me racism isn't a problem anymore, or it is a problem, but it's not our problem. I apologize. I'm truly sorry. And when I am honest with myself, I have known the truth, yet I kept it buried. Ignorance is bliss, they say. And then once I finally woke up, I was frozen by the thought of not showing up perfectly, therefore wanting to avoid feelings of embarrassment and shame. I see so clearly now how I allowed myself to avoid the discomfort of anti-racism work. 
And isn't that what rape recovery is all about? Navigating, looking at, feeling and healing. Not running from distracting or diverting. So I can now see so clearly that my recovery journey is not complete without prioritizing anti-racism. I have spent several years going deep into understanding and healing intergenerational trauma related to my own family's ancestral wounds. I believe that the healing that we do today, individually and collectively, heals backward in time and forward in time. So today I have the honor and the privilege in this space, in this capacity to say, I am so sorry for any harm that any of my ancestors have caused the black communities and the black communities ancestors. My healing will not be complete until I recognize the deep wounds that the black community has experienced and do all that I can to use my awareness and privilege to move beyond apology and make amends today and every single day going forward. To make amends is different than offering an apology. Making amends is to change behavior, to provide reparation or compensation for wrongdoing. So I promise to keep doing the work of learning and unlearning. I promise to do my own work and to not ask black folks to teach or show me how. I promise to speak up. I promise to keep going, especially when it feels like too much, because I realize that taking breaks is a privilege and we don't have time. This house has been on fire for over 400 years. I promise to use my body and my privilege and to use it in front of black bodies when necessary to prevent harm. I promise to be open to feedback and to remain teachable and humble. I will get things wrong, but I promise that my heart will always be in the right place. On behalf of the She Recovers Foundation, but more specifically from the very deepest place in my own heart, I want to apologize and make amends to every black woman her family, and her ancestors for any harm that our organization may have done to date. We apologize that we were focused on increasing diversity without acknowledging the underlying issue of racism and its potential impacts on women of color. As an organization, the She Recovers Foundation is committed to making sure that recovery spaces are welcoming and supportive for Black women. We will continue to use our platform to center and amplify the voices of Black women in recovery. We will continue to listen, learn from Black women in our community, and step back to allow Black women to lead. As we structure our newly formed board of directors, we will ensure that we build the diverse board. In our partnerships and strategic relationships, we will ensure that we only align with other organizations who are doing their own anti-racism work as well. We will continue to support in any way that our trusted advisors, Sherry and, Best and Esther require so that they can continue to hold space for other black women in the ways they feel appropriate. This includes the She Recovers support for Black, Indigenous, and Women of Color community, which currently consists of a Facebook group and weekly Zoom gathering. We will continue to support all of our awesome She Recovers coaches of colors, and as we can, help amplify their consulting and coaching businesses. To that end, we have been working with Esther and Sherry as they develop their own incredible offerings related to healing racism and recovery, and more to come on those offerings soon. We are also providing scholarships for Black, Indigenous, and women of color who feel called to attend our trauma-informed yoga teacher training. We do better when we know better. As an organization of recovering women, we believe our recovery work must include speaking out against injustice. And as an organization with a community mostly comprised of white women with the platform with the potential to reach hundreds of thousands thousands of individuals, it is our responsibility to speak out and act against harm and injustice being inflicted upon the Black community and, and individuals 
because Black Lives Matter. We will continue to do our own work to recognize our privilege. We will own our part. We will strive to do better. We will continue to use the gift of recovery to show up and make radical changes. I'd like to end this with the promise. We will remain teachable to listen, to learn, and to unlearn. And for all that we learned today, Jocelyn, Sherry, Esther, and Dr. Valerie, we thank you. Thank you so much for that. It was, it was beautiful. I could feel it. Say to all of us, black, white, mix, to be gentle with ourselves, especially this next day as we intake all this information, all this sharing, this release that has happened, to be soft, um, to know that we might feel uncomfortable that we might feel shaken, that wounds might have come up again. But as was mentioned, this is, um, this is why we enter recovery, to be able to work through the big things that are going on in our life, in the world, without needing to numb. We are strong individuals getting through what we did with our use. We can do this. I will be doing the same thing to processing as well. But thank you so much for sharing that. I felt it all the way over here in Vermont, across the wave. I accept your amends and thank you. We are one and I felt that oneness in your amends. Thank you, sister. And on behalf of my ancestors and myself, I wholeheartedly, deeply accept your amends. Here and receive your amends. May you be purified. Thank you. Aaron, I'd also like to say that, um, first I'd like to thank you for the acknowledgement and to thank you for your commitment to this work. Um, I've said it before, I consider you an ally and I receive your amends for myself and for my ancestors. Well, like I said, this is the most meaningful opportunity. So thank you so much for trusting me and trusting us with this. It means so much. And this is just the beginning, right? This, this, is, this is just the beginning. So thank you so much, everybody. What an honor. And I'm wishing you all the most beautiful day.